God will deal with the injustices. God will deal with the devil. And human history is playing out this epic story of good versus evil, of death versus life. And yes, there's suffering, but suffering is our opportunity Mm -hmm. to make sure that our faith is real and that I see the two sides of it. Hi, I'm Brandon Briscoe, and welcome to another episode of The Postscript, Living Faith Bible Institute's weekly podcast and YouTube series devoted to interviewing pastors and professors from LFBI and across the Living Faith Fellowship. This week, we are going to have a theological conversation about a character in scripture that has often eluded the scholars. On today's episode, we are going to be addressing the creature in scripture referred to as the Leviathan, uh, described in the Bible as monster, a monster of the sea. Psalm 104, 25 says, so is this great and wide sea wherein are things creeping innumerable, both small and great beasts. There go the ships. There is that Leviathan whom thou hast made to play therein. These wait all upon thee that thou mayest give them their meat in due season. Uh, but who is he? Who, who is the Leviathan? What is his story? Uh, does he still exist? And if so, what are the implications for the believer? Leviathan has been the subject of writers and poets for thousands of years and has perplexed theologians for just as long. Today, we've invited uh, doctor and pastor Chris Best, missions pastor at Midtown Baptist Temple and missiology professor here at the Living Faith Bible Institute to discuss the Leviathan today. And so with that, Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's good to have you, man. Oh, it's great to be here. You got stuck with this subject. This is a tough one. This is a great subject. But it's, it's fun. It's fun. Yeah. 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 I was kind of thinking, I want to interview Chris. I want to interview him on something fun. And then we started talking about it. And this just seemed like an area that we were both interested in, in addressing. Yeah. No, it's it's great. It's a it's a super topic. Um, I think it's going to be very interesting for for listeners. Let's get into it. I'm going to start by reading Job 41.1, which this, this passage is probably the primary text on the subject of Leviathan, though we'll come to find that the character exists by different names in other places. We'll come to find that. But this is the primary text on the Leviathan. And so let's look at Job 41, verse 1. Canst thou draw out Leviathan with an hook or his tongue with a cord, which thou lettest down? Canst thou put a hook into his nose or bore his jaw through with a, a, a thorn? Will he make many supplications unto thee? Will he speak soft words unto thee? Will he make a covenant with thee? Will wilt thou take him for a servant forever? Wilt thou play with him as with a bird? Or wilt thou bind him for thy maidens? Shall the companions make a banquet of him? Shall they part him among the merchants? Canst thou fill his skin with barbed irons or his head with fish spears? And so what, what we have here is a lot of visual imagery. Yeah. A series of rhetorical questions that kind of paint for us, a, 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 on the surface, it seems like a very mysterious picture, but we want to dig into this. And so here's my, my, my question to begin with. Uh, there are many theories about the Leviathan, many different descriptions of, mm-hmm. of what people think he is. Many theologians have studied this for a long time. Religious texts speak of him in, in many different ways. Um, we know that the, the, the Canaanite texts of the Ugarit describe the Leviathan as the dragon, the crooked serpent, the tyrant with seven heads. And as the uh, El's calf Atik, the Jewish apocryphal book of First Enoch uh, mentions Leviathan. It says in, in First Enoch 60, verse 7 uh, through 8, and verse 24, it says, On that day, two monsters will be parted, one monster, a female named Leviathan, in order to dwell in the abyss of the ocean, over the fountains of waters and, and the other side, a male called Behemoth, which holds his chest in an invisible desert, whose name is Dundayin, uh, east of the Garden of Eden. These two monsters are prepared for the day, uh, for the great day of the Lord, when they shall turn into food. Um, so obviously, you know, those are apocryphal accounts that we can't take as scriptural, but they give us some insights. People are talking about Leviathan. It's a big deal in religious history. This is my first legit question for you. What are the working theories among Christian biblical scholars about who Leviathan is? What are people saying? If we were reading our Bibles in Job 41 and went and 
found a commentary. Like, who is this Leviathan anyway? Who is mm -hmm. this mysterious creature? What would be the prevailing theories about that? Okay, right. so you've got the whale guys. Mm -hmm. So Leviathan is a whale. So this position would come from the natural world and from a study of the original languages. And then just human, kind of an academic approach, you might come up with the, the theory that Leviathan is a whale. Now... Mm -hmm. You can actually make a case for whale based on, on Hebrew and, and based on some of the verses. So, for example, in Genesis chapter 1, uh, verse I think it's, it's verse 21, and God created great whales. That, that word whales, uh, it's also translated as serpent or dragon in mm -hmm. other places in Scripture. In Lamentations, it says... Uh, the this same word tan is the singular. They they give suck to the young. It's like a mammal. Mm. Okay, so based on all that, someone could say, well, whales are kind of sea monsters. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're like nice sea monsters. Some of them. Some of them. Yeah. Yeah. Like not all of them, but right. but but whales are they're like sea monsters. Yeah. Uh, the Bible set, talks about being a mammal. That would be like what we call a whale in the natural world today. And so if it's translated also as these other things, well, then if whales are sea monsters, then all sea monsters must be whales. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the logic that they right. would come up with. Well, Leviathan, he's a sea monster. So it would fit historically. People are always afraid there's thalassophobia, the fear of the deep and the creatures in mm -hmm. the deep. Like which, every, which I kind of have. Well, everybody does a little bit. Like yeah. you're out there and it's like, oh man, like yeah. who knows what's out here, right? Yeah. I mean, the, but, the, the ocean and the deep, this would be a whole nother great study, of course. Yeah. But there's so much of it that has never been discovered. There's so much we don't know about the bottom of the ocean oh, and, yeah. what, and what exists down there. Yeah. Which helps with, you know, some of the mystery surrounding Leviathan. Absolutely. And and Leviathan's a mystery in the Bible. Right. So here's this mystery in the Bible. And then the so I was on a missions trip and, and I you know, off co in Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. And we took a I took a I took a kayak out. And I'm out there, it's probably a quarter mile offshore. I was kind of nervous, you know, being out that far, but I mm -hmm. kinda wanted to be adventurous. And, sure. And all of a sudden these fish started jumping around me. They're like this big. Yeah. So like two, in two my half, mind, it's feet. a big fish, and they're yeah. all coming up, and and I'm like, they're trying to get away from something. What's what what's chasing these fish that are that big up out of the deep? So I'm just like, oh, started paddling back. <laughs> I don't know what it is, yeah. but I got to get out of here. It's like like right. you know, like starting to panic a little bit. Like there's something big out here in the deep. Okay, so for just in terms of the natural world and. You know, you could you could look at the Hebrew and just use logic, and and you could come up with the whale position. Right now, does a whale actually fit the description of Leviathan in Job forty one? Not in the least. No, not in the least. But they kind of just well, uh, all sea monsters are whales. So right. so there's the whale position. There's the uh, crocodile position. Okay. The crocodile one. Okay, so this is based on an anthropological, historical perspective. And so it would go something like this. Well, the scripture, you know, is written to, to this original audience and their understanding, you know, these cavemen that it was written to, <laughs> right. their understanding <laughs> would be of some sort of sea creature that's terrifying. So let me think, um, that, that would probably be a crocodile. Mm. Because that's what the original audience probably would have thought of when they think of some sort of terrifying sea creature. Right. It's scaly. It's it, scaly. It's got sharp it's, teeth. It's, it's got big teeth. It lives in the water. You don't right. want to mess with it. So it, it's probably a crocodile. So so the, the commentary would, would maybe talk about Leviathan and some aspects of it and what the passage context is. And then they'll go, yeah, it's probably a crocodile. Right. Even though a crocodile doesn't actually fit the description, no. they're not actually looking at the words of scripture. The crocodile, and this is the majority position, would be the crocodile position. Mm, okay. And so it doesn't match up very well, mm -hmm. literally, plenary, biblical inspiration, like, like, However, they're look they're not looking at it like that. No. They're looking at it from an uh, historical 
type approach and their mm-hmm. hermeneutic. Okay, so so those are natural creatures. There's other things like the allegorical approach. Uh-huh. And then there's people that say, well, Leviathan is a whirlpool. Mm-hmm. Okay, so this gets interesting. And some of it based on, like you'd mentioned, the Ugaritic texts right. the, and these different myth mythologies and creation accounts of different religions. And, mm-hmm. and so, so I'll give you a story. There's a group of monks. Um, and, and so the, the St. Uh, Brendan was his name. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So he's off on his, on his boat and they stop at an Island and they go to make camp and they put up their tents and they build a fire when they built that fire, it's like, this isn't an island. This is a giant sea creature who's now like squirming because of the, mm-hmm. the pain from the fire and goes under. And when, when, when that sea monster goes under, he creates a whirlpool just because of yeah. the vacuum yeah. sucks. And then they barely escaped with their life. Okay. Okay. That same story, that same legend is out there. In all these different cultures. Okay. So there's different sea monsters that create these whirlpools. And then what's and, and then so there's a some iconography there. So the, the whirlpool actually comes itself to represent the sea monster. And then that allegorically represents Satan in these different cultures and mm-hmm. religious stories, even creation myths, to where it's it's God's war with so it's the the god of order versus chaos. Right. Yeah. And so here's this horrible, inescapable whirlpool in the deep, sucking people inescapably to their death. Mm-hmm. And that that imagery is is what is comes to represent chaos. So it comes to represent the chaos and the devil and everything. And so you know people allegorize Leviathan. And they say, well, yeah, all that stuff you guys are talking about, like, is it really some sort of animal? That's all cute. But really, this is an allegorical Mm -hmm. understanding. There's no real Leviathan. There's no real, it's not an alligator. It's just an allegory. So so that's a relatively popular Mm -hmm. approach. And then then finally, I guess the last one in terms of what are some popular working theories among biblical Christian scholars, the last one would be, it's actually a dinosaur. So these are the creation scientist guys, the young earth guys, and they yeah. they got their bow ties on, <laughs> and they're like, you guys are crazy. It's obviously a chronosaurus. Can't you tell? And I'm like, well, I don't know what a chronosaurus is. Right. Like, I don't, you know, like, <laughs> I'm like, I have no yeah. idea what these are, these dinosaurs you're talking about, because only they know. But But they're using a scientific, rational approach. They're like, no, I do know what a chronosaur looks like, and it's exactly what's being described there, or right. a sauropod as the yeah. behemoth. And let's be, the, let's be real honest. No one knows what any of the dinosaurs look like. Nobody, right, right. But that's, again, that's a whole well, other subject. Well, they do. They're convinced they Because they got bow ties, and <laughs> they're giving tours at the Creation Museum and all that. Like, right. they, they're, they're, yeah. they're, they know all that, but okay. I, I don't. Yeah, so. yeah. But they get their position from their understanding of a scientific understanding of what the dinosaurs look like, and they just use a logical, scientific, rational right. approach in, in their own mind. And so those would be popular theories. Right. So, so with that in mind, why, why does a biblical approach take precedence over that anthropological informed, that scholarly approach, those theories that you mentioned? How does, how does a comparing spiritual things with spiritual things um, a, approach to God's word provide us with the insight we need to create definitions surrounding Leviathan. Yeah. Okay. So that's relatively simple. Okay. So all of these different theories, different religions, even throughout time. So, so for, from a Christian perspective, people are taking Job 41 and they're examining this passage in light of the natural world, mm-hmm. the original languages, history, anthropology, and culture, allegory, iconography, right. taxonomy, science. They're, 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 they're taking scripture in light of all that and with human rationalism in place, they're guessing. Mm-hmm. Whale! You know, right, yeah. Crocodile! Dinosaur. Like, like none of them know. Mm-hmm. And what they've done is is they've come up with some really good guesses based on all of those things. But the reality is, if they're honest, they've put their scholarship 
Because mm-hmm. they'll even say things like this. Well, you know, I disagree with Brandon, but I, appro- I, you know, I, I approve of his scholarly approach. Mm-hmm. He's done a good job of studying out the issue. And, and that's like, okay, three verses tell you who Leviathan is, <laughs> what he is, and what's going to happen to him. Yeah. Like, like, in other words, you don't need all of this faith in human scholarship and all, all these other considerations. The more you add to Scripture, you're just taken away from truth. Sure. And you end up with good guesses that none of them are actually right. Right. And I think, yeah. I think a lot of it is motivated. We don't have to go down this, this too far, but I think a lot of it is motivated by, uh, you know, shame. Um, shame to take a literal view. Yeah. And so, and so what you do is because you don't want to be a Christian quack and, and you don't want to have views that seem uh, exceptional or fantastic um, uh, you, and, and you don't want to be perceived as less academic or intellectual, uh, it motivates one to take these other approaches. But it, by, by doing that, you make scripture secondary to your, the, your presumptions and the theories that you had developed. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and you're, you're examining scripture, Job 41, for example, in mm-hmm. light of your scholarship. Mm-hmm. Instead of taking scripture, Job 41, in light of other scripture. Right. Like, yeah, let's do the work. Let's study this out. But the process that you're describing, the comparing scripture with scripture to establish the working definitions uh, for, for this or anything else, uh, what do we learn from this process? So we're going to engage in that process right now. We're going to begin comparing Scripture with Scripture moving forward in our interview. Let's maybe just start with Psalm 74 and uh, verse 14. I'll okay. read that. Um, and then we can, talk about, we can talk about what we learn from the text itself. Perfect. Okay, so Psalm 74, 14 says this. Thou breakest the heads of Leviathan in pieces... And gavest him to be meat to the people inhabiting the wilderness. Okay, here's a statement about the Leviathan. Let's just talk about what we learn from this statement. And we'll do this and then try to gather all the data. Yeah. Okay, so thou breakest the heads of Leviathan. Okay, so so Leviathan has multiple heads. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now we've added that data to what we've talked about in, in the verses you've read out of Job 41 so far. Mm-hmm. So now we, we have more data. We can do a more comprehensive study on this because now we know a lot more about Leviathan than we did before. Yeah. Okay. And, so- and, and the odd part to that is that, that that bit of information alone undermines all of the other positions yeah. Yeah. immediately. Yeah. It's because not a- I've, Two-headed crocodile. No, it's not a, yeah, yeah, yeah. So just the pl- the pl- plural heads, right? Yeah, uh, is enough information for us to know that there's some there's something unique to this. It just beast. got more mysterious. Yeah. So uh, Isaiah twenty seven one says, "In that day, which is important, mm-hmm. well, I think we'll come back to that idea later. In that day, the, there's a future day. The Lord, with His sore and great and strong sword, shall punish Leviathan." the piercing serpent, even Leviathan, the crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what's happening here and then also provide some insight into to this description for Leviathan, if, if we can. Okay, that, there's a lot in that verse. In that day, so we're talking about at Christ's return, mm-hmm. the Lord with his sore and great, Sore, S O R E, and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan. So, when Jesus comes back, he's he's going after crocodiles <laughs> because he hates those crocodiles, right? Because yeah, they've created a lot of havoc, you know, that, off the Florida coast or where, wherever. That dinosaur that still lives in the Congo, yeah, right. Maliki Mumbe, like like Jesus is going after <laughs> that guy because. Well, he's got his dinosaur sword out. Yeah, he's a dinosaur. Okay, hunter. so so no. Okay, now we're starting all this data. We're adding. Okay, we've added two verses. Uh-huh. We haven't had to go back and study history, culture, anthropology, natural science. Just comparing scripture to scripture. All of a sudden, now we're getting some insight. Mm-hmm. So what's happening in that day? Like what's what's going on? What yeah. do we need to know? Yeah, that's judgment. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, there there is a spiritual battle that's taking place. And here's this mysterious Leviathan who's been concealed. Who, who Okay, now he, all of a sudden, when, at Christ's return, there's going to be judgment where Christ is going to, what, what's it say? Uh, shall punish Leviathan. Okay, and then he's... He's, just, he's given some other identifiers. The mm-hmm. piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent. Mm-hmm. Okay, so Leviathan is also a serpent. Right. So he's, he's probably not a dinosaur, and he's probably not a crocodile, and he's probably not a whirlpool. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and shall slay the dragon that's in the sea. Leviathan is a serpent. He's a dragon. He's in the sea. So who is the serpent and the dragon that's going to be judged mm-hmm. at Christ's return? Right. And so now it's all of a sudden light bulbs are starting to go off right. a little bit. Right. Yeah. And I think it's also interesting that Psalm 74 also talks about judgment, not maybe as explicitly, but it does say that he's going to make this dragon meet to the people inhabiting the wilderness. In other yeah. words, there are going to be a people group in the wilderness, and I think we'll come back to some of this, yeah. but, but that will we'll actually get sustenance from, the, from the, the, the death of this creature who is a dragon and a serpent. Yes. We're two verses in, and look at all, we, we now have a, a comprehensive data set to work through. Right. And we're done talking about crocodiles and whirlpools and mm-hmm. whales and all that. Now, all of a sudden, comparing scripture to scripture, we're starting to see, oh, there's something here that needs to be studied out and appreciated. Right. I just love that. Yeah, that I, that's yeah. why a biblical approach in our hermeneutic is so much better than the scholarly, you know, academic, anthropological yeah. approach. Yeah. And, and I think it's also just important to remind ourselves that the Bible is fantastic. Yes. That's why, that's why, uh, you know, it's so wonderful to engage with because it tells us things that go beyond our wildest imagination. That isn't something to feel shame about or, or, or give us a a conviction to, or guilt to explain it away. Uh, we don't need to do that. Um, and especially as Christians, I mean, if we believe our God rose from the dead, which is fantastic enough. Absolutely. Well, then anything's possible. Yeah. So then rather than throwing away what seems illogical to our rational modern minds, why not just trust it for what it says? Exactly. Yeah. And then it gets, it's fascinating. It's exciting. It's a cool study. Yeah. So let's, let's read again. Let's revelation chapter 12 verse seven says, and there was war in heaven. Okay. We've already talked about judgment and, and, engagement in, mm-hmm. in, in battle, right? Uh, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. So we have new characters that are entering into to the play, spiritual characters entering into play here. And the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out in the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And so here we don't see the word Leviathan. But in the last passage, we established that there that Leviathan and dragon and serpent are synonyms. Yes. That they're all interchangeable words that, that, that the Bible establishes as, as working counterparts. And we see those words here. So just briefly, what's happening in Revelation 12, 7 through 9? And then let's go back to Job 41 and kind of extrapolate some truths about Leviathan based on that. So, so okay. tell us about Revelation 12, 7. So Revelation 12, the context is the tribulation. Mm-hmm. And if we started at the beginning of Revelation 12, um, I think it's verse 3, we would find there is, get this, a seven-headed... <laughs> yeah. Red dragon in heaven making war against this woman who typifies Israel, uh-huh. who has this son. And, and th- so there's this war in heaven with a seven-headed dragon. 
okay, we, we saw he's got multiple heads. We saw that there's judgment coming. We saw, so just like you said, we've now identified him. So we know who he is. He's, he's Satan. He's a devil. Mm-hmm. We know what he is. He's a dragon. Also the serpent, Leviathan. Mm-hmm. And, and we know what's going to happen to him. There is a time of judgment coming. So, so that's the context is the, the great tribulation where there's this war in heaven and the dragon is then cast down to earth. Mm-hmm. So, so, that, so now we've added even more data into our comprehensive data set. So all of those other studies, people are just guessing in three passages. We know who he is, we know what he is, and we know something at least about what's going to happen to him. Right. Man. Right. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So fun. Yeah. Very fun. Great yeah. insight. Let's get more. Okay. So we know from scripture, when we read about the devil, we read about Satan, that he takes different forms. Okay. And so I want you to help us reckon this because there'll be people in the audience who are listening. Will they say, well... I mean, isn't he in, I thought he was like an, an angel of light, like that he could disguise himself in many different ways. And, and I, I didn't, in my mind, I, di- I didn't imagine that he would, he could just take any form or, or what form is this dragon? I mean, it seems like a fairly permanent state of being, but also, you know, again, we have a, we have a description of Lucifer who becomes Satan that looks completely different than even what we hear here. So what, how do we reckon all these different uh, uh, bodily forms of the devil. Yeah, okay, so he can appear as an angel of light, uh, at least his angels can appear mm-hmm. as, an, as an angel of light. Um, he was the anointed cherub that covereth. Okay, so we know he, had a, he, he was a cherub, and if we compare Ezekiel chapter 1, with Ezekiel chapter 10, we can see the nature of the cherub where they have four different faces. Mm-hmm. So you've got the man, the ox, the lion, and the eagle. Mm-hmm. Okay. And the ox is the face of the cherub. So with you know, that's where the horns and the tail and the hooves and the pitchforks. Well, yeah. the pitchforks. Yeah, that was added later. That's added later because yeah. of a probably his other form, right? We know he has multiple forms. He can appear in different ways, but what's his, what's his true nature? What is the, what's, okay. I think what we have is in Genesis chapter three, who shows up? It's the serpent in revelation. Who is it? It's the serpent, the dragon, Mm-hmm. You know, so throughout scripture, there is this subtle, more subtle than any, any of the rest of creation. Like, like snakes are sneaky. They could, they could be right next to you. Don't even see them. They're, they're, right. They like to conceal themselves. They're super camouflaged. And, and, and what we have is one form of the devil, of mm-hmm. Satan, which is the dragon. Mm-hmm. And this form is being revealed in Job chapter one. Yeah. Okay, so th- we've already covered, man, there's throughout history, throughout different cultures and religions and, and even Ju- Judaism and Christianity, people have been talking about this. Who is Leviathan? Who is this mysterious creature? I don't know. How would anybody know? No one can tell. Maybe it's, a, oh, Job 41 tells us who he is. Yeah. So so what we have is this form of the devil, his his true form perhaps. Mhm. His fa- maybe his fallen form. His fallen form. Because he has a pre-fallen form that we can identify in scripture, the yes. Luc- Luciferian form. Yes. And then there's maybe a fallen form. This is his natural state. This is this is his natural state. Why do you think it's important in Job 41 that God reveal this form to us? Like like God's giving us insight. Um there there's no no words in scripture that aren't relevant and important. Right. Uh, and so why is God giving us this information? So so the book of Job is all about human suffering. Mhm. And what's the cause of human suffering? Why do bad things happen to good people? Why would God, who's a loving God, allow my mom to die? And then, and then I'm going to be an atheist now because I'm so mad at God. Mm-hmm. Okay, why do we have suffering in our world? Why is there evil in our world? Okay, there is a malevolent being 
behind the scenes. You, you know, all through Job, Job and his friends are all talking about God and God's righteousness and God's judgment. And th- what You know what they aren't talking about is the devil mm-hmm. who's actually the one Hey, Job's wife, like, why don't you curse God and die? Well, why would you curse God? The, the devil's the one who did all that stuff. Mm-hmm. There is behind the scenes a malevolent evil at work in this world. Right. And he wants to stay hidden. He wants to stay, stay concealed. He doesn't want people to know his nature. He wants people bad mouthing God for the problems they have in their life. Mm-hmm. When God's done everything to reveal himself and draw people to himself so they can escape the corruption that's in the world through lust and the death that's in the world through Adam that we've Mm -hmm. all inherited because we all sinned. And Mm -hmm. and so God's doing everything. And so what Job 41 does, it just pulls back the curtain. Mm -hmm. It's like, there he is. I will not conceal him. And he's terrible. He's terrible. And, and, And you don't think for one second that you have the strength and power to rule over him. Exactly. Oh, that's, that's, that's my re- job. That's a really good point. Yeah. That that comes out in, in Job 41, you, you can't handle this. Yeah. Like yeah. just the side of him, you're undone. Yeah. You need, but I can. Mm-hmm. And, and so it does, it reveals who the devil is. And then that's a really awesome point. And I think it's verse 10 yeah. of Job. Um, None is so fierce that he dare stir him up. Who then is able to stand before me, God says. Mm-hmm. You can't stir, you can't deal with him. Yeah. How are you going to yeah. stand before me? You know, like I created him. I, so anyway, yeah. Yeah, there's two, so, there's two statements. So, so let, let's just look real quick at, okay. at, at verses 8 through 13. All right. Uh, because there's a couple statements there. One you just mentioned that I think are really important to, 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 to the why. Lay thine hand upon him. Remember the battle, do no more. Behold, the hope of him is in vain, which I think is, is an important point. Mm-hmm. Shall not one be cast down even at the sight of him? None is so fierce that dare stir him up. Whom then is able to stand before me? So he's, he's comparing like, if this guy is this fierce, right? Yeah. Who, who's able to stand before me, right? Yeah. He's even using the power of Satan to contrast his own power. Who hath prevented me that I should repay him whatsoever is under the whole heaven is mine. I will not conceal his parts, which is the part you mentioned. I will not conceal his parts, nor his power, nor his comely pr- proportion. Uh, who can discover the face of his garment or who can come to him with his double bridle? So, so what, maybe just real quick, what do we learn about Satan from that description? So, you know, Satan's power... Um, is way beyond anything that we would dare tackle on our own. We cannot stand before him. And, and, and so without Christ, without God, we, we are without hope against this adversary, mm-hmm. against this, this right. Leviathan, who we don't even understand him. We don't even, like, people are talking about crocodiles. <laughs> like, like, what are we going to do right. against the, the true enemy, against... Nothing. We right. okay. So so as powerless as we are, um, and, and I think you know the people that are like challenging the devil all the time. I, I think, eh, don't the Lord rebuke thee? No, right? that's, that's that's a common thing among I think um, Pentecostals and Charismatics specifically. I don't yeah. want to overgeneralize. That's where I see this happen the most, where people make a mockery of the devil, and and they're convinced that they have they have power over him. Uh, which is probably a a mistake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Consider yeah. Leviathan. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, let's yeah, consider. Let's let's okay. describe him physically. Can we do that? And then we'll interpret as we go. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to read again. I'm going to read a portion here, and then I'm going to have you summarize it. Okay. Okay. So let's follow along closely. Who can open the doors of his face? His teeth are terrible round about. His scales are his pride. Shut up together as with a close seal. One is so near to another that no air can come between them. They are joined one to another. They stick together that they cannot be, uh, be sundered or, or, or cut, you know, or torn apart by his kneesings, which is a word we recognize now as sneezing. Okay. Mm-hmm. So kneesings, a light doth shine and his eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. Out of his mouth go burning lamps and sparks of fire leap out. 
Out of his nostrils goeth smoke as out of a seething pot or cauldron. His breath kindleth coals and a flame goeth out of his mouth. In his neck remaineth strength and sorrow is turned into joy before him. So he, he finds, you know, he finds joy in, in other sorrow. Mm-hmm. The flakes of his flesh are joined together. They are firm in themselves. They cannot be moved. His heart is as a firm, is as firm as a stone. Yea, as hard as a piece of of the nether millstone. Uh, When he raiseth up himself, the mighty are afraid. By reason of breakings, they purify themselves. The sword of him that layeth at him cannot hold. The spear, the dart, nor the uh, habergen. He esteemeth iron as as straw and brass as rotten wood. The arrow cannot make him flee. Sling stones are turned with him into stubble. Darts are counted as stubble. He laugheth at the shaking of a spear. Sharp stones are under him. He spreadeth sharp points, uh, pointed things upon the mire. Okay, summarize that for me a little bit. Okay, so verse 14, he's got the doors of his face and these teeth. That's like a reptilian. So so he can open and close, like the like close off his nose to go under the water. Crocodiles have those funky eyelids that, mm-hmm. that have multiple layers, right? You know, and and so that sort of a thing. He's got this reptilian face. He's got these scales which are joined together, impenetrable. Mm-hmm. He's fire breathing, and his his body is you know also very strong, very impenetrable. The weapons of man, ah, he just laughs at it like. Like straw. Mm-hmm. Iron is like straw, you know? Right. So basically, to summarize this, this this is a fire-breathing dragon. Yeah. <laughs> this fire-breathing reptilian creature with these teeth, it's exactly uh, what fits in terms of, of this description, mm-hmm. which fits nicely in our body of data that we are now comprehensively looking at, that Job 41 actually... Looks like a fire breathing dragon, which yeah. is what Revelation 12 and Isaiah yeah. 27. It's confirmed. It's, it's confirmed there. Yeah. So then there's this next part here in verse 31 okay. that I think is, is really good. I want you to describe. There's some things here that I really uh, think our, our audience needs to, to have a better understanding of. So verse 31 says, He maketh the deep to boil like a pot, He maketh the sea like a pot of ointment. Okay, so we have the word deep being, um, you know, a, a synonym of the, of, of the sea. Okay? okay. He maketh a path to shine after him. One would think the deep to be hoary. And, and we know the word hoary in scripture as meaning white or, or snowy like. Yeah. Right? Describe what's being said here. What is meant by the deep? Help us understand the associations here. Okay, so... With the deep and that is also the sea, we mm-hmm. basically have two options. Mm-hmm. So in Genesis 1-1, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the deep. Mm-hmm. So there was just this this world, this universe of water. Uh, Unformed matter and water. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It was called the deep. So then what happened was God said, let there be a firmament in between there. And so this water was separated, this this deep, we would say, mm-hmm. was separated into two parts, with the firmament being space in between the two waters where the sun and the moon and the stars were hung. Mm-hmm. Okay, so Job is talking about the deep. So we've got two options, the waters above or the waters below. Right. Those are the two seas that could be called the deep, where the waters are, where a sea monster dragon could live. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when we're looking at this passage, he maketh the deep to boil like a pot. He makes the sea like a pot of ointment. He maketh a path to shine after him. One would think the deep to be hoary. So... You picture this creature moving through the seas, and it's stirred up the bubbles and the 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 waters, and yeah. and so it's and then it, it seems to create a a frosty or or um, opaque mm-hmm. uh, effect on the water 
water we usually imagine to be translucent, like you can see through it. Mm -hmm. um, but he he creates kind of like this this hoary or white path. Yeah. Um, where his body is. Okay, so then the question logically is, do one of these two seas have a hoary appearance mm -hmm. that it would also be the home for a fire-breathing dragon? Okay, so we've already seen in Revelation chapter 12 that during the tribulation, the dragon, Satan in his dragon form, is cast down to earth. Mm -hmm. Cast down from where? Well, there is a war in heaven. He's, he's not in on the earth. In fact, the next verse in Job says, upon earth there is not his like. Right. Okay, so if, he's, if, if we could take that to be a hint. He's, and, and plus, we don't see in our deep a gray, fire-breathing, frost-covered deep, but we do in the waters that are above, in the deep that's above. Right, which is described in Scripture as the glassy sea. The glassy sea. Revelation 15.2 says the glass sea mingled with fire. Mm -hmm. Okay, where's the fire come from? Well, it's because it's containing a fire-breathing dragon who out of his... And he's got right. it stirred up, and there's a sea of glass, and it's covered with a froze like like right. So and this so, is important. So just just briefly to summarize, and I want you to continue to to break this down. But what we have here is that there is a body of water that separates our universe from the third heaven. Yes, right. It 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 is uh, a space that is one cannot pass through unless they have angelic access. Right, and so there are spiritual, there's celestial beings that are allowed through, and there, and we should point out there are celestial beings that are not allowed through, that don't have full access. And if we look at Job, we see that the devil has the presence of God, and yeah. he has access at least in terms of dialogue with God, but also you know scientifically, I just want to point out, and I think most people know this, that there is a large amount of water in our universe that scientists can't seem to find. They know it's out there. Yes. They make they make uh, scientific claims about it, but it's a mystery. And I think that that affirms, like if we're going to use science to affirm scriptural truths, yeah. Uh, I think that that's an interesting, at least anecdotally, an interesting fact or observation to make. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's fascinating. It is fascinating. And it adds into this body of evidence that we're now putting together that Job chapter 41 is super fascinating. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad I didn't just look over at the, the footnote in my study Bible that said, it's probably a crocodile. Right. And then just, and then go on to, to Psalms. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, this is like, opening our eyes to, to what's behind the curtains in terms of spiritual reality. And we're just like, we're just getting started. Like, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. we could probably go down the rabbit hole yeah, for sure. and, and then do nothing. Like we're not <laughs> making disciples. We're just like counting yeah. scales or something, but, but the Bible is that cool. It's so cool. It's so fascinating. Right. Hey, thank you so much for listening to the show. We're going to pause right here for just a second. So we can hear from one of our students from the living faith Bible Institute. Hi, my name is John Scott. I go to Northside Baptist Church in Columbus, Ohio, and I'm an LFBI student. LFBI is spectacular. It's an institute that is taught by pastors as opposed to professors, people who are actually in the ministry with their feet on the ground, in the dirt, making disciples, evangelizing, and actually loving people. And it's the best resource out there for any sort of Bible teaching. In my life, I've used many of the classes. One in particular is the evangelism class. After going through the course, I was able to transform by God's grace the whole method and the, and the whole process of the Bible study where it is more evangelistic and we're able to actually reach out to people and then actually study the Bible together. It's something so simple, but man, it's, it's because of LFBI that that changed. Now, now we're able to plug that into an evangelistic ministry that we have out of our church. So I couldn't recommend LFBI more. To enroll for classes, visit lfbi.org. To support LFBI, please visit lfbi.org slash support. So it says in verse 33, you mentioned this already, upon earth there is not his like who is made without fear. So describe what is being said here. Maybe tell us a little bit about the fear factor uh, of, of Leviathan. 
Yeah, so um, the, we know about Satan. We know about Lucifer, the anointed cherub that covereth. And, and, and he was perfect in the day that he was created. He was complete. He was the total package. And then his pride was his downfall. And, he, and then he started saying things like, I will be like the most high. I will set my throne above, you know, and, and, he, and then the, all the eyes of Isaiah 14. And, mm -hmm. and you look at Ezekiel 28 and you, and you see, here's this person uh, who thinks he's got it going on and his beauty and all of that caused, okay, he didn't fear the Lord. Who's, who's he going to be afraid of? He's like the anointed of all creation. Mm -hmm. Well, he he should have feared the Lord. Yeah. Okay. That should have been enough to, you know, cause him to hold his tongue and, and to realize he's just a created being like everyone else. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he is without fear. He doesn't fear anybody. He doesn't fear. Now, he should fear the Lord. He doesn't. So, you know, here's this, he's the king that the next verse talks about the king over the children of pride. Mm -hmm. And I think if we were just to contrast, you know, fear the Lord with someone who's full of pride, well, he's, he is absolute in that. Mm -hmm. That's, that's his absolute stance is no fear. So I don't know. There's probably more to that. Yeah, but. no, that, I think that that's great. I love, I love that. I think we need to make that connection to verse 34 that you just made, that he's the king over the children of pride. Um, that, that again, that's a perfect description of what we understand of Lucifer and the, and the Satan figure. Yeah. Um, so it's another, it's another data point that draws that, that parallel that we need to know who Leviathan actually is. Um, yeah. he, he is, he is the one, um, he's the king uh, over the children of pride and he is the king of the, of, of pride itself. You know, that is his, his primary character quality is that he is proud. Yeah. So it's interesting. We see that pride coming through different leaders and world powers throughout the history of, especially like the old Testament, mm -hmm. like you see Pharaoh and, and you see Sennacherib from mm -hmm. Assyria. And you Who also have hearts like millstones, by the way. They have hearts like <laughs> millstones. Um, okay, it gets, it gets cool if, yeah. if we want to go there. But behind it all, concealed, hiding himself, mm -hmm. is the seven-headed dragon who is the father of pride. And it fascinates me that, okay, so we're stuck in time-space living out along a, a linear timeline our earthly existence. Okay, but God's some of the things that we're living out, like like in Hebrews chapter eight, it's like, oh well that's just a picture. That's just a shadow. So your physical reality, that that tabernacle you built according to the pattern in the mount and all mm -hmm. that, that's just a shadow of heavenly things. Right. Your earthly things are just a shadow of a heavenly reality. There's so you built a temple. Well, there's a, there's actually a heavenly temple. Mm -hmm. Oh, you had an earthly priest. There, there's a heavenly priest. His right. name's Jesus. Oh, you have you have earthly Jerusalem. That's cute. Wait till you see the heavenly Jerusalem that's going to come down. By the way, when there will be no more sea, mm -hmm. and heavenly Jerusalem now comes down, and the the heavenly reality, and the earthly shadows are going to all like become be, one. Become one. Okay, so what if that seven-headed dragon is actually the heavenly reality and those seven heads are like like if you study out the headship, the different heads of the beasts and that sort of thing, that's like the king over this and the king over that. Yes. So if you take Satan outside of time and he's been given seven different world powers over the history of the earth... So we don't have time today, but you can line up those seven heads with seven different world powers throughout the old, throughout Scripture. Mm -hmm. So you get four of them in Daniel chapter two, and then before those, you get you get Egypt and Assyria. That oh, by the way, the Bible calls them the dragon. Like he's speaking to the devil through Pharaoh. Right. And he's like, oh, I'm going to put a hook in your mouth and draw you out. Mm-hmm. 
Oh, it's a Job chapter one. Can you put can you yeah. put a hook in his mouth and draw him out? Yeah. No, that's what. Oh, so that's a fascinating study. No, and I think it's important. I'm yeah. really glad that you're bringing this up. I was hoping that you would address this. Okay. Because I think that those are important truths from Scripture that people need to understand, and it isn't. And that isn't that that mysterious. I mean, this is again, it's going back to comparing scripture with scripture, and you discover that 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 these heads do symbolize world powers, and we can see those world powers divided out over time. We 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 see them in Daniel, and we recognize that they they have servitude to a the, the prince of the power of air and his agenda, the king the king of the children of pride, and he has an agenda. That's, that is intended to undermine the heavenly kingdom agenda. And this, this thing that you're talking about in terms of the reality coming down, yeah. that's what we see in Leviathan himself, the physical, the physical presence of Leviathan. We see that in the embodiment of all of these, th these things we know to be true in the physical realm are actualized in a bodily f form. Yeah, so when God says in Job, I will not conceal. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think, okay. So call me crazy, but I think in the tribulation, there's gonna be a giant dragon falling down. Yeah. <laughs> like, they're like, oh, there he is. People have been looking for him throughout all of human history. There he is. It's actually a, a giant dragon right. that's right. been concealed because that's what snakes do. Mm -hmm. He didn't want, he knows he can't win. He's trying to hide. He's trying to, you know, when Pharaoh says, who is the Lord that I should obey him? That's not Pharaoh talking. Mm -hmm. That's, that's this dragon. And anyway, so yeah. yeah and, 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 and if, you know, we don't, again, we don't have time to go down this road, but that dragon takes other forms too. Like there's an argument to be made that that's his watery form. Yes. Yes. But then when he steps onto land, he has a, a, a different form, a physical form um, that, that looks like a different type of beast. But what we do learn and what I think is important for us to address before we go is that he has a fate. There's like a, a fate that's, that God has intended and is making very plain that he is going to deal once and for all yes. with this, this person in this form. And then there'll be a, a wrath for him, a judgment, uh, yeah. a future judgment. Yeah. And that's, so I'm reading Job and I'm struggling with the, the losses. I'm dealing with the hardships. I'm questioning, you know, what, like, God, mm -hmm. what's going on? And I read about Job. And then from, from Job 1, I see God and the devil are talking. And then Job's the, 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 the character of the story. And then all these things happen. And throughout the whole story, God's getting blamed for what the devil did. Mm -hmm. And in the end, when... God has a chance to question. I'm sorry, Job has a, a, a opportunity to question God. And God's like, hey, you got something to say? And he's like, no, no, sorry. Like, <laughs> yeah. And then, okay, so then I realize, oh no, God will deal with the injustices. God will deal with the devil. And human history is playing out this epic story of good versus evil, of death versus life. And yes, there's suffering, but suffering is our opportunity mm -hmm. to make sure that our faith is real and that I see the two sides of it. Death mm -hmm. is horrible. The separation that comes from death and we bereave, we're bereaved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I'm going to see him again because I've put my faith in Christ. Mm -hmm. And that dragon, according to Colossians chapter two, like Christ, like we win. And I can read about that in Revelation. Mm. It's like, yeah, like it's yeah. so good. Right. To to just compare scripture to scripture, get some un a comprehensive understanding and, and I can see the whole thing and that just helps yeah. me. Yes. Okay, you know, then I can just keep trusting God. Yeah. I don't understand at all. I in fact, you know, the more I learn about Leviathan, the less I know. Yeah. I don't know anything. Mm-hmm. I, I you know, I but I do know this, God is good and there's a spiritual battle taking place and I know which side I want to be on. I'm going to yeah. trust in him. Yeah. No, I really like that because I think you pointed out that there's bookends, right? So in the garden, we invited a sub subtle serpent <laughs> yeah. to deceive us. And that deception has resulted in millennia of pain and suffering. Oftentimes we find ourselves questioning the Lord himself for why this is, why things are this way. Mm -hmm. He's like, oh, you've forgotten. 
let you've forgotten. Let me show you. Let me remind you. I'm gonna. You've got Job 41 in your Bible for a reason. I'm gonna pull back the curtain. I just want to remind you of the dragon that you invited into this perfect world. Yeah. The, this this Eden that I created. You invited this in. But then we also have the victorious story of, uh, you know, at the other end uh, of, of of the narrative where he shows us that he's going to deal with a not so subtle serpent. Yes, <laughs> you know, right. He, he's become a little less subtle in the end and he's going to deal with him outright. Yeah. Man, praise the Lord. That's awesome. Yeah. And then, you know, don't be a Bible scholar that looks at Job 41 and says, yea, hath God said. Right. Like, no, let's just, let's compare scripture to scripture and let's let the Bible be authoritative. And then we get these insights and yeah. it's, it's, oh, it's so affirming. It's it so is. good. It's fascinating. Bible yeah. study is interesting. It's not boring, you know? So I think, you know, as we close out, I, I do have a question. I think it's important. So, you know, why are conversations like this one important? And, and what does it mean to be able to have a, a study of deep things like this, but also avoid, you know, emphatic forms of speculation. Like, I think there's room for speculation. I think there's room for us to, to say to ourselves, well, you know, this could be this or, or that could be that, but to take our speculation and make it insistent or dogmatic. Why is that dangerous? T tell us, tell us the value of, of deep study and, and searching these things out, but also the danger of, um, majoring on minors. Yeah. So I think the, you know, the benefit that we get from a study like this is it affirms our faith in God's word. Mm -hmm. And so our faith needs to stay in God. God's words are the words he meant for us to have. They they have been inspired and preserved. And the the verbal inspiration of God's word, we believe in that. Mm -hmm. The plenary inspiration of God's word, meaning that it's all authoritative, you know, e even the list of names and, and the way it's put together is by design. It was inspired. And so I can not only study Leviathan and Job 41, I can also go, I, I also know that Isaiah 27 and Psalm 104 and Revelations chapter 12 and Revelation 15 and 21, those are also authoritative inspired words of God. And so I just let the Bible be true. And mm -hmm. when I do it and I get this sort of comprehensive data set that then as I work through it, it's like, whoo, Mind blowing, yeah, right? It's it, it's the lights come on, and now I have an understanding I didn't have before, and I would not get that if I was comparing scripture to human rationalism, anthropology, culture, history, science, nat natural science, taxonomy, right. or or whatever other things that people examine Job forty one with. Like mm -hmm. none of those things qualify, right? Only God's word. And so what happens is we get tremendous insight and an appreciation for God's word when we when we rightly divide it and actually our hermeneutic lines up with what we put on our church's doctrinal statement of faith. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I get these insights. Here's here's the you mentioned now I have this speculative inference that I got by comparing 75 verses and somewhere down the line I come up with some like I had a guy come visit my class recently and he's like I know where the devil is he's in the what's what's the really deep trench in the ocean Mariana Trench or something yeah, yeah. anyway whatever that is sure he's like I know exactly where he is and he had done all this work and <laughs> longitude and latitude from like scripture references wow okay so this guy was in you know, in the mission, trying to put his life back together. But he knew exactly where the devil was. And it's like, well, okay, that's probably not true. <laughs> I'm I didn't tell him that, but yeah. I I'm just thinking to myself, he's got this thing that he's grabbed onto. And the first time we meet, I'm his pastor, like he's visiting my adult class. And, mm -hmm. and, and he's not introducing himself to me. He's not listening. He's telling me what he knows. Yeah. Okay, here's here's the thing. If any man thinks he knows anything, he knows nothing so yeah. yet as he ought to know. So the more I learn, the less I know. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so if you don't understand that that saying, then then you need to. Yeah. The more we learn, the less we know, and the more I am, and 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 just I just want to direct people to the to the word. Hey, this is what it says. This is what it means. I don't have all the data, yeah. but the Bible does, and it has everything we need mm-hmm. to live our lives and to understand what we need to understand. So I think it it should res- it should cause a humility in us, not a pride in us. Right. We've studied Leviathan today. Okay, probably our listeners know more about Leviathan than they did when we started. Mm -hmm. But our attitude ought to be, man, I don't know anything about... I just know like three, four four verses (laughs) counting Job 41. Like, man, I think you could study this out the whole rest of your life and you'll never fathom the depths of it. Right. And so our attitude should just be, you know... God knows right. he's right. I'm going to keep studying. I'm grateful for what I've gleaned, but I, I don't know anything. Yeah. Yeah. Chris, thank you for modeling for us what it looks like to study something out that seems mysterious, uh, you know, um, that seems almost, you know, like a peripheral subject matter. But but once we get into it, the Bible's pretty plain about it, and we can learn all these interesting truths and make these correlations in Scripture. You showed us how to do that, but then you reminded us, uh, to not get puffed up when we learn new things, yeah. Because when we do, um, it produces arrogance. It, it we begin to speak in a way that's unbecoming of a of a believer. It's truth without grace. Yeah, it's we start like, speaking evil right. of people who don't know what we didn't know an hour ago. Right. Like, yeah. <laughs> okay. God forbid that we right. would do Absolutely. that. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you, Chris. I'm I'm really I'm thankful just to study the Bible with you. It's fun. It was super fun. Yeah. yeah. I I loved it. Yeah. Thank you. And we thank you too for joining us for another episode of The Postscript. Uh, I hope you enjoyed just hanging out and studying God's word and learning something. Uh, Some of you may have studied this before and it was just a review, but but for some of you, it may have been new. I wanna point out that there is a way of studying the Bible. The Bible's clear about it. There are principles that the Bible teaches, insights it gives us in how to approach the word of God so that we can glean truths for ourselves. We can learn how to study it and discover things. We don't have to go to our pastor. We don't have to go to a priest. We don't have to go to someone else, a leader in ministry, and then walk away and say, well, you know, my pastor said, no, we can, we can know for ourselves what the word of God says and what it teaches, not to be arrogant or proud, but just to have insight on who, into who God is and what his mission in this world is, that we might be more in tune with his purpose for us. If that interests you, if you desire to know more about God's word, we invite you to check out the Living Faith Bible Institute. Uh, we, we, we would ask that you visit lfbi.org and learn about who we are, uh, about our statement of faith and, and how we approach God's word. Come look at the classes that we offer. We offer classes on, on many, many different subject matters, um, including how to study the Bible. But we would love for you to join us. Uh, we want to see you ministering in your local church, uh, empowered by what you're learning uh, there as a disciple of Christ, but also uh, as you grow in your knowledge of God's word with us and your ability to minister will only just increase. And so uh, we ask that you check that out. And with that, uh, besides that, we love you and we're grateful for any of the time that you've given us to hang out with us. Uh, We care for you. If there's anything you ever need, feel free to reach out. If you have comments about the show or you got questions about these episodes, we would invite you to to reach out, email us through lfbi.org. But uh, we're grateful for your time and we ask that you would join us again next week for another episode of The Postscript. God bless. Thanks for listening to The Postscript. If you enjoy the show, please leave us a rating and review in order to help other people find our podcast. If you value this show, please help us continue creating content by supporting Living Faith Bible Institute at lfbi.org support.